On the topic of gigs, you might know our next speaker from the work that she did at the ABC's Ramp Up disability and diversity portal that she started a few years ago. She also made her debut at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival earlier this year with a great show called Tales from the Crip. And when she got here, I said to her, are you all right if I mention uh, in, in your introduction that you did the show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival? And she said, yeah, sure, that's fine. As long as you mention I did win Best Newcomer. <laughs> oh yeah, and deservedly so. She's an amazing woman. Stella Young is gonna speak with us now. Give Stella a big round of applause. <laughs> This ramp, it's enormous. I love it. I love getting to um, a, a function and there's an amazing ramp because so often I'm greeted with very poor access. Like at uh, my friend Mo's house, I was on my way in a cab and said, I'm on my way to yours. And he said, oh, good, good. I've built you a ramp. And when I arrived, I discovered that by built me a ramp, he had knocked the legs off an old Ikea kitchen table and laid it down over his front steps so that I could risk life and limb entering his abode. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate good access, it's very, it's very good. Um, and I want to say another thank you to the, the WISE employment uh, stand-up crew. They were just amazing. I think we need another round of applause for them. That was great. And Maggie, I hate to tell you, I am one of those women with a lot of shoes. In fact, I had some friends come around on the weekend and stage a bit of an intervention. So I threw out 13 pairs of shoes that I had very rarely worn. And my shoes don't wear out. Like, they just, I get sick of them and so I throw them out. But they don't, they don't wear out, I don't outgrow them. It's pretty brilliant. But uh, I still buy more and more shoes. So anyway, but thank you for that, that was great. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, the founding fathers of disability, the first people to really rock it, to invent some great prosthetics, to really just take their impairments and mess right and get on with life. I am, of course, talking about pirates. <laughs> yes, yes, word up to the pirates. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about my employment story. As Adam mentioned, I, uh, I was running a website called Ramp Up at the ABC, but with the federal budget funding cuts, uh, I actually lost my job, which is a very interesting place to be in when you're someone who you know, advocates for access and disability rights and uh, objects every time Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott talk about the 800,000 people on the disability support pension. I actually kind of want to stop doing this kind of work, go back on the pension and just rock up to Tony Abbott's office and say, 800,001, dude. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention all of the writers that I employed um, to work for Ramp Up. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, I grew up in a really small country town in Stall in Western Victoria, uh, and I had a really normal upbringing. I've got two younger sisters. Both of my parents uh, had a very strong work ethic. They both ran small businesses. And there was never any thought that I wouldn't grow up to have a fairly normal life. You know, a life where I went to university, got a job, just did all of the things that my non-disabled sisters were expected to do. Uh, and my parents always taught me that I could be anything I wanted to be, to the point where it was a little bit ridiculous. You know, when I was four years old, I decided that I wanted to be a plumber. Yeah, I really wanted to be a plumber. I don't know, maybe I figured that being small would be an advantage. You could fit in all those squashy places, no matter how disgusting they are, um, to be a plumber. Uh, thankfully, that ambition made way for something else about two days later. But my parents were really encouraging. They told me, that I could be anything I wanted to be. And as I grew up, I realised pretty quickly that they were lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were lying. Um, I worked really hard in high school. I had a job, after school job in my mum's hairdressing salon. And uh, that might seem like an unlikely job for a wheelchair user to have, but you know, I made the coffees, I scrubbed the combs. If I never scrub another comb in my life, it will be too soon. Um, but I, I just had like a normal kind of after-school job. Both my sisters also worked in my mum's salon when they got older. Um, and so I sort of had no 
concept of discrimination. I hadn't really thought about the fact that I wasn't going to work in the supermarket or, you know, as a, as a waiter or as any of those things. I just thought, oh, yeah, I've got a job like all my friends do. It's fine. And then I went to university and I studied journalism and PR at university and women's studies. And when I left, when I left university, or just before I left, I did an internship um, with a very big news organisation, starts with A and ends with C, and you pay eight cents a day for it. Um, and uh, in, this, in this internship, it was a mentoring placement, and I was living in Geelong at the time, I went to university in Geelong, and when I rocked up at the ABC, the director of news and current affairs at the time said, well, I don't think you've really thought this through, this career in journalism. You know, people have to be very mobile if they're going to be journalists. And given that I'd made it, even though I was living in Geelong, to a 7 o'clock editorial meeting, 7 a.m., um, I thought he's questioning my ability to get where I need to be when I need to be there was a little bit rich. Um, and so I got kind of quietly huffy, but I thought, no, I'm going to stick out the rest of the day. And it was a good thing I did, because he delivered two more pearls of wisdom. Um, <laughs> once he realised that I was um, a little bit competent at what I was doing, he took the time to take me aside and tell me how brave and inspirational I was, helpful. Uh, and then later in the day, he asked me if I lived with others like myself. <laughs> and I said, if you mean starving students who've lived on alfalfa sandwiches for three weeks, Yes, I do live with others like myself. <laughs> so it was at that point that I decided that I might need something to back me up, that this path into the career that I thought I was going to have because I'd, you know, worked for it was in fact not likely to go as smoothly as I'd hoped. So I went back to university the following year and I did a teaching degree. Um, and, you know, at the time, Teacher shortage, teacher shortage, everybody wants teachers. I was like, right, well, everybody wants teachers. I'm going to become a teacher. And as I studied teaching, I remembered what a passion I have for young people and for influencing uh, the, the lives and the attitudes and the passions of future generations. And I was pretty gung-ho about being a teacher. I thought, this is going to be great. There were a few little hiccups along the way because we couldn't find my, the people who were running the course couldn't find accessible places for me to do my teaching rounds. So they couldn't find schools with access, uh, which was fairly interesting. Uh, there was one school that I did a placement at for three weeks that had no disabled toilet. So in order to do that placement, I just thought, I want to do this placement, I'm just not going to mention it. So I kicked my coffee habit pretty quickly, and I didn't consume any liquid until 2.30 in the afternoon because that's what I had to do in order to go to this school and teach these kids all day. And let me tell you, year eight English is a very tough sell last period on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> much more so if you've got a massive dehydration headache or you're busting for a wee. So, you know, I made some sacrifices that in hindsight, I shouldn't have had to make, of course, but I was so so passionate about working. I thought, don't make waves, don't mention anything that will make them think you're a difficult employee. If they think there's any extra expense involved, then they'll never give you a job. So I, I did my three teaching rounds and that was fine. And then I started writing my graduate applications. You know, everyone's looking for graduate teachers, everyone, everyone, everyone. Who? Who was looking for graduate teachers? Because I was a graduate teacher. And for about eight months, I went to several interviews a week. I sent lots and lots of applications. I looked great on paper. And as soon as I arrived, there'd just be this little flicker of, oh, dear. Hmm. Uh, and I, I had to eventually toy around with whether or not I disclosed that I was a wheelchair user. So if I said on the phone, I just want to make sure your interview space is wheelchair accessible. Then things like this would happen. One school principal had my application in front of him when I arrived and scrolled across the top in big black texture was wheelchair. Hmm. 
Interesting. Um, if, I did just, if I didn't disclose, then things like this would happen. Oh, oh, the, st the stairs in into that room. Where are we going to? Oh, where are we going to do this? We might have to do it on the oval. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I had a, a school interview on the oval. Um, I went to disheartening interview after disheartening interview, where principals asked me questions like, "How are you going to reach the blackboard? Really, really, a blackboard? What century are we in, dude? Honestly." Um, I went, to, I went to so many of those interviews that I eventually actually started to self-sabotage a little bit. I went to one interview at a Catholic boys' school, and I'm not Catholic, uh, but what we're taught to say if we're going for jobs in Catholic schools is that we're able to uphold the ethos of the school. Like, just promise not to start a same-sex marriage rally in the hallway <laughs> during your first week. You know? Like... Um, and so what I said, when, because this was one of the interviews that had to be conducted outside, um, what I said to these very robed up Catholic dudes at this big private Catholic boys' school in Mentone, um, they said to me, so are you a Catholic yourself? And I said, nah, but I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I eventually decided that I was doing myself no favours. <laughs> and uh, so I went, I went and applied for a job at a disability organisation where I knew that they'd be busting to employ a person with a disability. You know, I've got the right look for it, don't I? <laughs> uh, and as sad as that is, that is true. That is true. Somebody in that job at some point told me that I was always going to get that job because I was the only person with a disability who had applied for it, which is actually a very disheartening thing to hear. You know, it wasn't about my skills or my qualifications. It was a job I was qualified for, but it wasn't the job I wanted. I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a communications coordinator for a disability arts organisation at that point, although I did love that job, and I'm very grateful that somebody gave me a job. And it sort of got my skills up. Sorry, I'm breathing a bit funny. I've got four broken ribs. Um, <laughs> That was not a workplace accident, it was a dance floor accident. So, ah, ah. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, anyway, I went to work for Arts Access and then after a few years, I thought, I just have to get out of the disability sector. I want to try this. I want to try having a job that has nothing to do with disability. So, I applied for a job at Melbourne Museum, teaching kids about bugs and dinosaurs, which was super, super, super cool. And the advantage of that was that I had actually worked with Melbourne Museum before on a project that Arts Access had run. So they were aware of my work, they knew that I could do the job, and they, they really kind of took a risk, I guess, on me. And I had learnt to handle myself much better in interviews by this point. <laughs> and I said, you know, are there any questions that you want to ask me about me as a disabled person that you might employ? And they said, well, one of the things that we have to do as a team here, I worked in public programs, is we have to pack up tables and chairs. And I said, cool. So is that something that every person has to do every day or is that just something that has to be done by the members of the team? And they're like, well, it just has to be done by the members of the team. And I said, cool. So if I do something else for a member of the team, like I do the volunteer briefing that morning, then somebody else could maybe pull my weight with the table and chair stacking, and they were like, yeah, totally. And I was like, right, that seems fairly easy then. They were like, and you don't need any special equipment? And I said, nope. And they were like, oh, oh, this is easy then. And I could sort of tell by their faces that I'd already gotten the job just by having an open and frank conversation with them about what disability means to me as an employee. And I really, did anybody see that episode of Insight last week, or the week before? About <laughs> hands up? Yeah, a few of you. So one of the things that I was really struck by in that episode was uh, the employers who were saying things like, well, if somebody comes to me and they're in a wheelchair, well, I can't put them in a job in sales, can I? Because they need to, you know, be moving around a lot. It's like, dude, what do you think wheelchairs are for? <laughs> like, <laughs> 
seriously, like the, those assumptions that people make can be so easily addressed if we just have a frank conversation about what you can do and what you can't do and what that might mean in a particular role. So I encourage you to not make those assumptions, but to just ask people, have those frank conversations. Um, anyway, after I worked at the museum, I worked at the ABC, of course, and have had a wonderful time there. And uh, I'm very glad now that that job is finished that I've had some stand-up success um, because, you know, and I actually said to, to the managing director of the ABC when he broke the news about Ramp Up, well, at least my comedy career is going all right, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you a bit, about, a bit about my employment story, but I also wanted to talk to you about the general low expectations that we have of people with disabilities. Um, because I talk to other people with disabilities about their careers as well. My friend George Teleporis is the director of the Youth Disability Advocacy Service. He's got a PhD. He's an incredibly smart man that I learn from all the time. And he went to a special school. And in his special school, he used to be driven past a sheltered workshop in a bus. They used to put them all on a bus and they'd drive them to the sheltered workshop to show them where they would work when they were grown-ups. The expectations that people have when they come out of special education are very, very, very low. I was lucky enough to be educated in a mainstream setting, which was fantastic for me, but it only happened because I was lucky, because I grew up in a small country town where we didn't have any special education settings. There was no choice but for me to be mainstreamed. And my parents fought very hard for that to happen as well. Um, there was a committee of parents when I was a kid to try and stop me who formed to stop me from going to school with their kids. Um, I don't know whether they thought it was like contagious or something, I, I don't know. But uh, when I was ducks of my high school, yeah, that's right, when I kicked all their kids' asses, I, yeah, I, I thanked that committee in my, in my speech. Um, but it really does make me sad that we, yeah. It really does make me sad that uh, people people with disabilities are still segregated in special education settings because it teaches people that they have no... Uh, it teaches people to have no ambition. You know, little young people who are told that they have no rights and responsibilities, they grow up to be people without jobs. They grow up to be people without the confidence to have jobs. And I think that that's something that we need to address within the disability community as well. Um, I was in America recently and I heard someone say, possibly the best thing I've ever heard. Uh, she said, the time for inclusion is over. We can't wait for non-disabled people to include us. We need to infiltrate. <laughs> I said, yes, that is excellent. I'm going to repeat that at every talk I give from now on. But anyway, um, I wanted to also just talk about the the statistics, you know, what, is, what does employment and disability actually look like at the moment? Um, did you know that compared with other OECD countries, Australia has one of the lowest employment particip participation rates for people with disabilities? We rank 21 out of 29 OECD countries. That's pretty disgraceful. Do you know what, does anyone know what the best country is? Mexico. Yeah. Might go there, I really like sangria and tacos. Um, but they have the lowest unemployment rate of people with disabilities. Uh, our participation rate has declined since the 90s. Graduates with a disability take longer to gain full-time work than other graduates. Surprise. Uh, people with disability have an employment rate of 3 point, sorry, 39.8% compared to 79.4% for people without a disability. So that means that half of disabled people, half as many disabled people are in paid work. Uh, a little under half of all people with disabilities in Australia live near or below the poverty line as well. Um, and in terms of quality of life for people with, people with disabilities, we actually rank last in that OECD list. Last. So... When we're talking about jobs, we also need to think about what people with disabilities' lives are like. 
in the context of the supports that they receive. So someone who isn't given the basic support to have a shower every day, for instance, you know, it's very hard to enter the workforce. We need to be looking at employment participation of people with disabilities as a bigger issue than just the workplace. We need to look at education and support and all of the other factors that play a part in people's work lives. We talk about work-life balance. You know, we need, to, we need to get that right for people with disabilities too. Um, I think that one of the problems um, with disability is the assumptions that we make about it. You know, everybody's trying to be very politically correct. We're all trying to use the right language. You know, we all have to say people with a disability now instead of disabled people. Um, and I say disabled people because I'm a, I'm a subscriber to the social model of disability, which tells us that we're um, disabled by society, not so much our physical impairments. Um, you know, people with a disability became this buzzword. It sort of replaced special needs, because I think everybody caught on to the fact that special is actually just a code word for shit. You know, it's very fashionable in the 80s when I was a kid. You know, dis people, kids with disabilities were called special needs. Um, but yeah, special is actually just a code word for shit. I promise you. Special scissors? Seriously, they were terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they thought I was going to do if I'd gotten my little crippled hands on the normal kid scissors. <laughs> Wasn't exactly going to run with them, was I? But, uh... <laughs> anyway, I should, uh, I should actually wrap up, but I, um, I did just want to say that there's one, there's one other myth that I, I want to bust about disability. Who has heard that stereotype that People with disabilities make the best employees. Have any of you heard that? You, you have? Yeah, show of hands, show of hands. Okay, yeah, everybody's heard that. Okay, so sometimes this is true. Sometimes people with disabilities make really good employees. And sometimes we don't. It's a surprising thing, isn't it, that disabled people were all quite different to one another. Annoyingly so, I know. People are dying to just put us in one category and simplify disability and say, that's what it is and this is who you are. Some people with disabilities are the workplace bullies. Some people are the slackers. Some people steal your sandwiches. You know, it's... People with disabilities are just as likely as anybody else to be a shitty employee or a shitty person. I mean, if Oscar Pistorius has taught us nothing else. <laughs> yes. Not too soon, good. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, look, Oscar Pistorius did always say that he wants to be just like able-bodied athletes, didn't he? Who knew he meant OJ Simpson? <laughs> uh, anyway, the moral of that story really is something um, that my dad has always taught me, that not all people with disabilities are nice. Some people are terrible. His exact words were, just because you're disabled doesn't mean you're not a dickhead. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dad. Pearls of wisdom. Um, I should actually wrap up because my, my time is up. Um, but I'm happy to take like a question or two if you, if you have any. Um, if you, and, you know, I think we just all need to be encouraged to employ disabled people. And whichever end of the spectrum you think we are at, be prepared to be disappointed. We're none of those stereotypes. Please give Stella a big round of applause. <laughs> We've got a chance for a couple of questions if people want to ask anything of Stella. We've got a couple of seconds before we run into our afternoon tea. Morning. Morning, Good, morning. Good point. It just feels a bit afternoonish. <laughs> our morning tea break. Anyone got any questions they want to ask of Stella? Can I ask Stella, but when, did you get a, a sense at a particular age that you were different? to other kids your own age. Can you remember that? Did that, does that just, is that instant or does that come on you slowly? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't particularly remember. Maybe actually when it, it was when I went to school, when I had to have an integration aid. And I didn't understand why I had to have this woman following me around all the time when none of the other kids did. Because <laughs> um, that had sort of not ever happened to me before. Like I'd always had a very normal kind of life. Um, would have been cool. It would have been almost like having a butler. 
Yeah, well, now I would bloody love it. God, <laughs> God to have a PA. God, but yeah, I would have loved it now. But uh, at the time, I just thought, who is this annoying woman who's always hanging around? Why is she coming everywhere with me? And I remember saying to mum and dad, you know, can you, can you just tell her to go away? And they're like, well, we can't because the school, you know, the school says that you have to have her, hmm. her hanging around. Um, and we eventually, you know, struck a balance where I didn't feel too um, sort of oppressed by her. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, suppose that, I suppose school was really the first time I figured out that I was different. And, you know, there were, there were moments like not getting invited to birthday parties or sleepovers or all of that stuff, mm. that very normal socialisation stuff that happens to a lot of kids for a lot of different reasons. When I was at the ABC in Sydney until the end of last year, there's a woman there called Jessica who works at the ABC and she came across on a, a particular placement. She has a, <clears throat> a learning disability and she works in one of the uh, news areas and her job, she has a series of jobs mainly to uh, sort out all the milk and everything for all the different canteen areas on different levels of the ABC and to get the papers around it. And it's, it's fair to say she has, she has limited work duties. She loves it. And with Jessica, every... And Jessica and I became... She was a big fan of me from the Triple J day, so I'd go and see her every couple of weeks and we became great buddies. Every time Jessica walked into a room or interacted with anyone at the ABC, she just brought this sense of happiness and joy with her that if you're going to, you know, try and balance the books, more than pays for whatever she was doing within the organisation and her wage. And there was something about the, the ABC making that little aspect of its workplace more inclusive and everyone was just so much the better. I don't know if you knew Jessica Tattersall, but everyone was just so much the better for Jessica interacting with them in their daily life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to have people with disabilities in our workplaces, in our schools. You know, I had a neighbour a couple of years ago who said to me, you're the first person with a disability I've ever spoken to. And I said, oh, weren't there any at your school? And he said, oh, no, 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 I went to a private school. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, but I come across that all the time. I come across people in their 50s who've never spoken to a person with a disability before, at least that they, they know of. Mm. And that's the problem with segregated employment segregated education is it teaches us that this inclusion thing or infiltration uh, is supposed to start at 18 and end at 65 and it's not it's kind of not like that look i'm sure that you will continue to inspire amuse and infiltrate give her a big round of applause winner of best newcomer at this year's melbourne international comedy festival stella young great to see you again mate <laughs>